very warm welcome. It's a total pleasure and joy uh, to welcome uh, Mr. Rahul Gandhi uh, to Cambridge, uh, to, to his own old home, uh, but also my home at, uh, here, uh, away from home in India. And it's uh, particularly nice that he chose uh, London and Cambridge to kind of break uh, the sort of fasting that has gone in mobility uh, during COVID. So it's, it's great that you're here. And I'm not going to sort of give a longer introduction because everyone knows who he is and it's, uh, it's a real honor to get the chance to speak with you on some of the most pressing issues, not just facing India, uh, because India is certainly facing a turning point in its identity, uh, but also globally I think this is a, a moment of identity crisis, not just mere crisis because of Ukraine, because of China, and of course post-COVID. So let me actually say that, you know, if we look at 75, 1947, uh, is a landmark event, of course, in world history, uh, not because India is, of course, the first country to be decolonized uh, from the empire uh, since America. So that in itself is a landmark event. Uh, but also, uh, the time was, you know, if you look at Nehru, uh, the old alum here, the great Nehru, who kind of is, you know, synonymous with modern India, the idea of freedom and optimism really captivated Indians, despite uh, as it were, the legacy of partition, the violent legacy of partition. I think 75 years down the road, uh, I think India looks quite different. Uh, I don't mean simply in terms of optimism or pessimism. Uh, freedom certainly seems uh, to be in short supply uh, in an everyday sense in India. Uh, but also, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's not really a, a secret uh, that, in a way, India seems to be preparing for a new identity to anoint a different kind of India, perhaps in the centenary year of the formation of the RSS in 2025, which is to say that since uh, the, the arrival of Prime Minister Modi, certainly in the second uh, mandate, uh, we've seen an aggressive recasting of India's legal and cultural institutions uh, to redefine its compact, not just with its own citizens, uh, but also in the world at large, its own identity in foreign policy terms. So let me, you know, we'll, let's break all of this down, but first ask you what, how you would describe the state of play in India at the moment. Why don't you come over here? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Like that. You have to move the chair closer, I'm afraid. Thank you. So if you look at the Constitution, and I said this in a speech in Parliament some time back, India is not described as a nation. It's described as a union of states. The exact, exact line is India, that is Bharat, is a union of states. And the implication of that is that there is an ongoing negotiation between this union of states. Right? So in the Congress party, we, we view India as a negotiation between its people. Mm -hmm. The RSS views India as a geographical entity. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the big difference. So for us, India comes alive when India speaks. And India dies when India goes silent. Okay? And what I see is going on is a systematic attack on the institutions that allow India to speak. Right? Uh, parliament, the election system, the democratic system, the basic structure of democracy is being captured by one organization. And as the conversation is being stamped out, the deep state is entering those spaces and redefining the way that conversation is held. And you can see, you can see the impact of this in different parts of the country. Uh, you can see this in the type of policies that are being implemented as well. So, for example, if you look at the way GST was implemented, uh, instead of having a detailed negotiation with the states. So that's a national taxation program. Right, the GST yeah. is the tax. Instead yeah, of having a uh, long conversation, detailed conversation with the states, it's just decided that on so-and-so date at midnight, we're going to do GST. 
right? So it is, what I see as the big problem is the stamping out of the voice of a billion plus people. And that, I am absolutely convinced, is going to have repercussions. Okay, so I'm considered to be a tough supervisor, so I'm not going to let you go off so easily on that one, because some people would say that actually uh, Modi is very popular, this has a huge amount of social mandate in India, uh, and that the victory of Modi, you know, in several regional elections, okay, some setbacks here or there, uh, that actually this is popularly mandated, that perhaps Indians have changed, not so much the idea of India. A democratic contest hmm. depends on certain structures. It depends on a election system that is free. Mm -hmm. It depends on a judiciary mm -hmm. that is completely independent. Mm -hmm. It depends on a press that is fair. And very importantly, it depends on the type of money that different political formations have. Mm -hmm. Right? So, if we are fighting an electoral contest, mm -hmm. and we are fighting the institutional structure of India, mm -hmm. right? we have taken, uh, we have taken things to the election commission, mm -hmm. uh, and we get no response. Mm -hmm. Right? There are, there are. Uh, you can see the press in India. I mean, the press. If you look at the television in India, there's one gentleman who's on it all the time. Nobody else. Mm -hmm. Right? So. <laughs> I mean, we know. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's, you know, you see one gentleman there, and, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he's the only gentleman who occupies that space. Mm -hmm. Now, in a, in a sort of 21st century environment, mm -hmm. uh, where your means of communication is media, where your means of communication is uh, social media, mm -hmm. and they have total dominance over those, uh, of course it will affect the mandate. Mm -hmm. So you think that in a way the story of Hindu nationalism, how would you kind of want to assess the ascendancy of the idea of Hindu nationalism in relation to say Nehruvian India or what Congress stood for, which was a multi-religious social compact? Uh, so don't you see that contest is much more about, uh, this is not unique to India, you're seeing such exclusive forms of neo-nationalisms across the world. Um, so how would you kind of, you know, how would you want to sort of make a plea now for, as I said, you know, for the older idea of India? Is it sort of worn out? Does it need to? I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to make a plea for it. No. Uh, that idea exists in India. Okay. And that idea is going to fight back. Now mm -hmm. the question is, how is it going to fight back? That's right. Right? Um, you can't, you can't impose a one ideology mm -hmm. on a place that is as complicated mm -hmm. as India. Mm -hmm. And you can see it. Mm -hmm. So as I mean as they push this sort of centralizing ideology, mm -hmm. you can see the result in states like Tamil Nadu, you mm -hmm. can see the results in states like Punjab, you can see the results in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Right? So you are you are putting pressure mm -hmm. on the union on the conversation. And it's going to react. If you think that it's not going to react, well, you're in for a surprise. So then to speak, put this on the kind of democratic map or the political map of India, do you think that this poses a particular challenge to the Indian National Congress? Because one of the things that struck me, because I teach a course in Indian democracy here, it struck me is that India is unique from other mass democracies, say like America or Britain, which have always had a two-party system right? You have the Tories and you have, you know, the Labour Party. And in India, you've always had one national party and lots of regional parties. And that was the story for the Congress. And now do you think mm -hmm. it's a change of hands that, or something else is going on? That's, I think, the uh, wrong characterization, okay. if I might say so. No. Go ahead. Because if you look at, <laughs> if you look at, again, view India as a union of states. Mm -hmm. Now tell me which state has more than two parties. Tamil Nadu has two parties, mm -hmm. UP has broadly two parties, so uh, Madhya Pradesh has two parties, Rajasthan has two parties. No, I meant it at the national level. No. In our system, mm -hmm. you, if you're going to compare a, a, a United Kingdom, mm -hmm. right, think of India much more like Europe than you think 
Mm-hmm. Uh, That's right. Then, mm-hmm. then like England, mm-hmm. right? Ingl- mm-hmm. India is much closer to Europe than it is to England. Mm-hmm. How many languages are spoken in England? Don't shame the English now. Right? Don't shame the English. <laughs> you know, it's just the, <laughs> you know. One. We grew up with three. They grew okay, up with half. Two. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so no, but we we have to get this right because if we're going to understand it properly, we have to get it right. Mm-hmm. So, it's it's. much more accurate to think of india like europe and think of a europe that is politically and economically united mm-hmm. that's what india achieved agreed. 70 years ago agree right which by the way europe hasn't achieved yet no it's a federation and broken again right. and and it's under pressure so what was achieved 70 years ago was quite a powerful unique thing absolutely right uh but it requires conversation between these states mm-hmm. now where does the where does the question of the congress party and the bjp come mm-hmm. in the the national party mm-hmm. right is the party that stitches up the conversation that's right right so actually i don't see it as a, a real challenge for the congress party mm-hmm. i see it as a huge opportunity for the congress party if the congress party reacts to it properly Mm-hmm. right and all political formations mm-hmm. go through transitions mm-hmm. right uh if you look at the record of the congress party everybody gets excited that you know we are now in not in power for 7 years we've been pa- in power for 70 years mm-hmm. right and we've played a significant role mm-hmm. in developing the country in in bringing india to where it is of course uh we need to reinvent ourselves that's right we need to rethink uh so that yeah we need to rethink what our role is we need to rethink how we interact with the people so what would be the first thing you would think requires a rethink the first thing that requires rethink is opening the doors of the congress party uh and bringing in millions and millions of uh, youngsters into the party so a new Yeah, right. that's the first thing. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> Now you're clapping, but this is not so easy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is not easy. When when I was your age, I was like, yeah, yeah, that thing's easy to do. Yeah. But after a while, it's not so easy to do. It can be done. It takes time, but but it's not so easy to do. The second thing is that there's a ideological fight going that's on right. in India. Right. Mm-hmm. There are two visions. Mm-hmm. one vision that says essentially the bjp vision rss vision says the social order needs to be protected mm-hmm. right india should progress but people shouldn't move up and down the social order mm-hmm. and what we are saying is that one man one vote mm-hmm. everyone should have equal opportunity everyone should have equal access this is a contest mm. No I I I get that and that takes me straight to the question of the economy because of course the UPA government in particular and just years preceding to that uh, you know was the high moment of India both in the global stage but also the liberalization of the Indian economy the rise of big tech in India and of course the most ambitious and largest welfare programs in the world such as the Manrega you know the minimum uh, employment guarantee scheme now the question really is um that sort of model you know in the sense you had high growth high private investment high liberalization high interaction with the global economy but also high public spending in india that so you know with on the upa uh, and the you know that seems to me and again correct me if i'm wrong uh, you know that 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 model doesn't seem to be a modi's model uh, because he has very targeted welfare schemes it's a whole So in in a way the economic kind of basis economic policies also that the UPA laid down your government laid down seem to be changing so where do you see the kind of economic scenario at a time actually um it coincides also with deglobalization so UPA was part of the global moment of you know accelerated connectivity in, in the world and now for the last 10 years 12 years after financial crisis uh you know there's a kind of slow deglobalization which is accelerated it seems after covid and men like modi seem to have gained under under such conditions so how would you do on that the, 
on the sort of Hindutva side mm-hmm. and on the exclusion side, mm-hmm. Modi is different than the Congress. Of course. Right? But on the economic side, Modi is taking what was sort of our middle of the road uh, mm-hmm. balanced ideas mm-hmm. to an extreme. Right? Say more. Uh, we would we were trying to balance the rural and the urban for example mm-hmm. we were trying to balance uh, big business and farmers and laborers he's not really interested in that balance his idea is uh, i mean i i get the sense he thinks uh, he thinks of the korea model where you have large big sort of chebol mm-hmm. right they monopolize mm-hmm. and then i think he 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 thinks he can give a sort of pay off to large numbers of people and let these people concentrate power and wealth mm-hmm. right in my view that won't work in india why you get a huge backlash mm-hmm. right you will get a backlash that you will not know what's hit you mm-hmm. uh, the other point is that view these things as a continuum right don't view them as UPA did something and now Modi is doing something they feed they feed into each other so mm-hmm. what do i mean by that mm-hmm. uh we did we did narega mm-hmm. right uh most people think narega is a handout to poor people no i don't but yeah you know, but yeah, most yeah, if you yeah, ask yeah. most indian people what is this narega they'll say well you know why are you giving why are you making people uh, lazy why are you giving them you know money in their pocket etc mm-hmm. etc actually Narega was a labor market intervention mm-hmm. right and Narega created a massive reaction yes in indian farmers it was a it was a very powerful move mm-hmm. but it created a particular reaction mm-hmm. right and then that reaction feeds in to what comes after mm-hmm. what i'm saying is don't think that good policies carried out now won't later create a backlash that gets you something that doesn't look anything like what you were doing right for example aadhar uh-huh. we had a totally different vision for aadhar so let me just say aadhar is unif- you know universal identification in right. india which was brought in um, you know you, your yeah. government had thought about it had had piloted it but it became a uh, standard procedure now in india so we put thing. we put in aadhar which is sort of a uh, unique identity yeah. right and in our wildest dreams we didn't imagine what aadhar would be used for yes right so so that that sense has to be there you have to you have to have a sense that something that you do right now looks very good can suddenly take another turn under another administration so you mean it's more about surveillance rather than about today yeah so oh, today, it, today, yeah aadhar today yeah. aadhar has become how would you describe it it's become a weapon okay it's become a political weapon So that actually right. takes me to the question on you know on actually big tech you know this is Cambridge this is the place where a lot of the tech happens for Britain and you know of course there was Cambridge Analytica as you know uh, from here on misinformation and in which actually Indian several Indian elections were involved as you know uh, pr- quite apart from Brexit and and what happened on the international uh, stage uh, so. Um, you mentioned monopolies also as well so the two related questions or you might want to take them separately uh, but it sort of you know even biden is facing the question of monopolies particularly around big tech and it's going to be a big story about his presidency whether that's going to be regulated or not uh, and uh, so i'm just so there's the problem of kind of uh, information around elections uh, you know campaigning Uh, around say facebook uh, and and whatsapp and other big tech and then there's a related question of monopolies which in india is not a tech monopoly in america it's a tech monopolies that they need to be broken how do you sort of see the new architecture of this kind of digital economy why do you say it's not a tech monopoly in india no i mean there's other ones too like adani right. i mean you know it's a multiple it's not simply tech monopolies it's mm-hmm. it's a kind of you know you know as you know that from airports to you know you were yeah. saying the other day you know that so so I'm, what i'm trying to say is that it seems to me that the world of deglobalization is r- r- leading to the rise of monopolies both in america and india for instance uh and in india it's kind of a cu- couple of places but in 
In America, it's much more about tech, as you know, and, and these are also related to politics, because how are we now going to conduct elections? Well, you know? I'll tell you my personal experience. I don't believe that uh, the large social media companies mm. are neutral. Mm -hmm. I just don't believe that. Mm -hmm. right? uh, at least my experience in Indian politics, mm -hmm. uh, and I can, give you, I can give you examples. I'll give you one personal example mm -hmm. where uh, on my Twitter account, mm -hmm. I was getting 40,000 new users a day. Mm -hmm. right? And then I went to a, uh, a girl was raped in Delhi, mm -hmm. a little know, yes. a Dalit girl, mm -hmm. and I went there and I did a protest. Mm -hmm. And magically, my Twitter users went to zero. Mm -hmm. They went from 40,000 a day to zero. Mm -hmm. right? and we wrote to Twitter and said, what's going on? Mm -hmm. like, please explain this to us. Mm -hmm. No answer. They said, we don't have the data. We don't understand this. We are checking. Three months later, we decided to get in touch with the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. And we told the Wall Street Journal this. And a day before the Wall Street Journal article was coming out, it went back to 40,000. Yeah, that's interesting. That's my experience. Right? Now, it's the same, it's the same with WhatsApp. I, I don't believe that these are neutral uh, platforms. Yeah. Right? So what is the, to be the, done the, about that? For example, the head of Facebook has never, never met an Indian opposition leader. Yes. Uh, right? He comes, he meets the prime minister, goes home. A, 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 I think the CEO of, the, of Facebook was a BJP person. In, in Delhi, yes. In Delhi. Yeah, that's right, right. So why are we imagining that this thing is, is a neutral entity? It's not. No, no, I'm not, I, I for I'm not uh, saying no, that. So, I'm not, then, I'm not yeah. saying that to you. Mm. But so, so the tech monopoly, mm -hmm. if, you look at, if you look at the way Indian elections are being fought, mm -hmm. they're essentially being fought on these platforms. Yeah, that's right. They're being right. fought on WhatsApp, they're being fought not so much on Twitter, but on WhatsApp, on Facebook. Yeah, uh, TikTok. On but oh, TikTok's gone. Gone, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> they were very important the last No, time. but this is very important. Yeah. But this is yeah. very important, right? Oh, yeah. TikTok's gone. Yes, Why Jack. is TikTok gone? Right? So, the first level of monopoly mm -hmm. is the media monopoly. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what someone said, 140, 160 uh, media entities owned by one person. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have a media monopoly, mm -hmm. and then you have multiple monopolies, uh, business monopolies right. that provide finance to the BJP. Mm -hmm. right. So that's uh, that's what we're facing. So how would you maneuver this? This if this is so kind of hegemonic and so all encompassing so the, in this description. The only way to face it is by going directly to the people, which is what the Congress Party did. Uh, before independence. That's the only way to face this. So back to Gandhi. Back to Gandhi. Social movement, protest movement, massive. Yeah, and there's a lot, there's lot of appetite for that. There's a lot of atmosphere for that. Mm -hmm. And the Congress party uh, needs to redesign itself to absorb that energy and use that energy to create a new vision for the country. Well, that's the... Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, move you on a little bit and move you to the international scene because a lot of people were uh, sort of, you know, we talked a little bit about America, a little bit about uh, tech companies, but we haven't really said anything about China. And China really is this big story for India. And, uh, and I think that hasn't really been appreciated in the international press at all. Uh, I mean, I've been on several panels and people are kind of always asking me fundamental questions as to why um, why, is, for instance, India takes positions that it does currently, but we'll talk about Ukraine in a second. But there isn't an enough appreciation of the Indo-Chinese issue at the moment. Uh, so tell me what you think about China as a rising global power and in relation to particularly its neighborhood and India. So I think uh, there are two competing visions now on the planet, mm -hmm. right? Uh, one is the Western, India's a part of it, which is a maritime vision. Mm -hmm. And the other is a terrestrial vision, the Belt and Road, and a, a terrestrial planet, mm -hmm. where most of trade moves from China through the old Silk Road to Europe, mm -hmm. and China dominates that trade. Right. 
those that's the that's the clash and that's what china is building mm -hmm. and what china is offering to the countries around it uh is the idea of prosperity mm -hmm. so china is saying allow us to build your infrastructure allow us to put in <laughs> the the communications backbone allow us to put in 5g allow us to put in all that stuff mm -hmm. we'll give you the money you build your infrastructure and then we will have prosperity together mm -hmm. that's what they offer and right? and it's a very powerful thing to offer mm -hmm. uh, but it's not in our interest you know it's not in india's interest that china uh, expands out like this why because we are on the way to europe or uh, just because we are physically there or is it a rivalry a civilizational rivalry I don't see it is a civilization ri rivalry but it will have severe consequences for india it will have serious consequences for india in terms of chinese expansionism so why do you think the international world is not fully aware the story is always told in terms of america and china and which is why people because, have because that's because that's really uh, those are the two poles right so america america defends and uh, defends one vision mm -hmm. and china is placing another vision on the table mm -hmm. now where i have a problem mm -hmm. is when the west speaks about china mm -hmm. and when the united states speaks about china mm -hmm. they always talk about stopping china's rise so they have a sense that you have to stop this mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. well that's fine mm -hmm. but my question is what alternative are you giving mm -hmm. right if if china's promising prosperity mm -hmm. uh, you can't say to india mm. that look we will have a defense pact mm. and we will fight with china mm -hmm. without the prosperity part of it mm. right mm. and so to, the indian trade has to continue well mean? so to me the real question mm -hmm. is if there is an alternative vision mm -hmm. that vision needs to actually create prosperity it needs to create wealth mm -hmm. right but sri lanka and and the chinese story hasn't really worked out or would yeah. you say it is of course i mean of course the, the sri lanka has gone very wrong mm -hmm. the chinese have put in a huge amount of money mm -hmm. huge amount of that money has been stolen mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't pan out mm -hmm. but the idea the chinese are proposing mm -hmm. is prosperity china they have given 100 billion dollars to pakistan yeah that's right? right yeah and so so they have a very clear vision about what they are trying to do and it's a powerful it's a powerful idea it's not uh, it doesn't have it's not that it doesn't have a basis mm -hmm. but from our perspective i think we need to have an idea that provides pros prosperity of course there is a there is a defense angle to it mm -hmm. but there has to be an economic angle to it right and currently i don't see the economic angle to it so in in you know our relationship with the united states yeah. for example yeah Uh, is hugely about defense. That's right. Yes. It's moving that way. Clearly. More and more. More and more. I mean, when we talk to the Americans and the Americans talk to us, we talk about defense. Yeah. We don't talk about okay, how do we jointly create prosperity and create a democratic model mm -hmm. that can make people rich? And does that worry you? Worry me? Yeah. It does. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So on to on to Ukraine, and that, and then I'll come to a final question before I open it, which is that you know the whole story of Ukraine. when india kind of as it were refused to take a position um spooked certainly the international media and strategic cir circles here uh, and uh, because it precisely for the reasons you have just mentioned that in the last 10 to 15 years india has been seen to be going closer to the us and then for not actually signing on to the un un store you know the un um amendment or not amendment the un uh, move uh, you know it was seen well you know what is india up to Uh, and the word that was used in india was that well india doesn't really want this bipolarity it's going to have a multipolar world how do you read this is this a continuation of uh, nehru's idea of non alignment which has been resurrected in certain kind of perverse ways again or is it uh, no i, I mean, don't I, yeah. i don't think the government believes in nehru's idea of non alignment mm -hmm. but i think the government understood its constraints mm -hmm. and it understood clearly what the constraints were and uh, I don't think they had much of a choice. 
myself right but but i think uh, i think it's better to have a foreign policy that is strategically thought out mm-hmm. instead of a foreign policy where you take one decision uh, with one event and then a suddenly another decision with another event mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Uh, and i also don't think it's about uh, being you know uh, with america or against america That's right. mm-hmm. i think uh, it's more nuanced than that i think india is a big country mm-hmm. and india has uh, multiple relationships and india has to deal with the complexity of its own reality mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay um so you know i'm going to ask a slightly semi personal question and then i'm going to open the the floor which is because you know obviously 75 years you know we can take small bite sizes into the last opening decades and now more recent decades but actually there's a middle period and we you and i both belong to that middle period of that generation which is that we are not midnight children we are born in the 70s we don't have any of the optimism uh, that our parents generation had and we of course also grew up with a lot of collective violence around us i in punjab but i was not alone there were people in the northeast kashmir uh but also uh, soon after that you had the hindu muslim story uh flaring up with the babri masjid uh mobilization and caste violence as well so violence you know has been a kind of big feature of people of our generation and in your case it's all too personal so you know we've just had a recent anniversary of your father's assassination this weekend so my question really is about actually a kind of gandhian question about uh violence and how to live with it and uh, in your case it's also personal and so could you sort of say a little bit on your own personal resilience on it but also how you envision the compact between violence and non-violence in indian society uh i think i mean the word that comes to mind is is forgiveness right mm-hmm. um it's not it's not precisely the accu- the most accurate it's you realize mm-hmm. what well, <laughs> i think you realize right <laughs> no because you you uh, i didn't mean to stump you but it's no, a very obvious it's a very no, obvious question you have to stump me but I no just... one's asked you i'm surprised no no they've asked they've have asked. they have they i'm not <laughs> then why don't you have the why, because i'm, I'm why trying, don't i know I'm the answer i'm trying to go deeper in the answer okay let's do this uh, so i think in life you will always especially if you're in in places where large energies are moving mm-hmm. right you will always get hurt it's not uh, if you do what i do you will get hurt it's not uh, a possibility mm-hmm. it's a certainty mm-hmm. right because it's like it's like swimming uh, in a in a ocean with uh, big waves mm-hmm. right you are going to go under it's not it's not that you're not mm-hmm. right so then when you go under you learn how to react properly mm-hmm. so when you when you uh, so loss un- is productive loss the single mm-hmm. the single biggest learning experience of my life was my father's death there is no bigger experience than that mm-hmm. right now i can look at it and say uh the person who or the force that killed my father mm-hmm. uh caused me tremendous pain sure is correct as a son i lost my father and many of you would have and that's very painful but then i can't get away from the fact that that same event also made me learn things that i would have never ever learned otherwise right mm-hmm. so as long as you are ready to learn mm-hmm. 
it doesn't matter how nasty people are or how na- evil people are as long as you're ready to learn mm-hmm. if i turn around and you know uh, mr modi attacks me and i say oh my god he's so vicious he's attacking me mm-hmm. uh, that's one way of looking at it and if uh, other way of looking at it say great i just learned something from him mm-hmm. give me some more mm-hmm. okay very gandhian uh, but now uh, yeah with you, you no, but you you come to this right when you're when you're facing uh when you're facing an attack you come to this there is no there is no other realization possible right. it's like it's like that there's there's a poem i i don't remember the name um it's written by i think i think it's a palestinian person right. who's been put in jail okay. i'll i'll send it to you okay. and he's talking <laughs> to the jailer he's talking to the jailer and the jailer um he says to the jailer look from the from the small window of my cell mm-hmm. i can see your big cell right, right. so everyone's in jail mm-hmm. <laughs> right 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 and and you've got to be able to see that properly right. and if you see that properly then you can figure out ways to deal with it or ways to get out yeah. thank you yeah first of all